but next Thursday, uh, we are not following the footsteps of Jesus because I'm going to the Emirates. Um, I, uh, I will take uh, Corona Malka with me, okay? We are traveling together. I'm serious. I'm totally serious. And therefore, uh, if you wish, we will be following uh, the footsteps of uh, Sheikh Ziyad, the one who actually established the Emirates. So you're all invited to an uh, unscheduled, uh, unplanned surprise for me as well, uh, a live Zoom tour on location from Dubai. That's uh, Thursday, all right? I'm not sure where exactly that will take place, and I know nothing about it. I'm going on an organized tour for the first time since I'm 13, and um, well, I'm really looking forward to it. So next Thursday is the Emirates. <laughs> okay, and um, what? Um, I actually had another announcement, but okay. Well, anyhow, uh, I'm not sure what I was about to say, but I do want to say something. Um, today, I was in Jerusalem, you know, as a preparation for the day after tomorrow tour. And uh, as I was driving towards the Knesset, you know, I drove road number one and quite a few of you drove down and up and down this road. And you remember these um, armored vehicles on both sides of the road? Um, I guess you do. So now they're all decorated with flags and uh, flowers. And, you know, this is one of the best known tragic heroic stories of the War of Independence. And as I was driving by, I thought like, how come that this became so well known? Like every single tourist hears that story as he's driving back and forth. Well, some other stories which are no less tragic, meaningful, heroic, um, personal, you know, you name it, they are unknown. And so I thought that I'm so happy that I invited uh, Yaniv uh, who is a colleague and a friend, and he will share his story. I mean, he's not old enough to share a story from the War of Independence, of course, but he will be sharing his family story, his community story, which is so little known, and I think we will do justice to it. So uh, he's not a native English speaker. Uh, I could not find somebody who will have a private story of Mishmar Yarden and be an American at the same time. It didn't work. So you will forgive his uh, Hebrew accent. He is born and bred Israeli. And well, I'm looking forward to hearing his story, his family story uh, with you. So uh, that's all I had to say. Yaniv. Thank you so much for joining us and you're welcome to unmute yourself and talk to us. Thank you very much. Hi everyone. Um, I'm really honored to be here. And if you please, I will um, wait a few seconds before I uh, share my screen. I want to tell you a story that demonstrate um, the feeling of this special, I call it a holiday, because it is a holy for me. When I was a young soldier, you know, uh, something like 35 years ago, and I, uh, I was lying in an ambush in the south of Lebanon. And uh, because I uh, operated the, uh, the big machine automatic gun, I had to uh, lie near my commander, my platoon commander. And um, I could see from the south of Lebanon, I could see the halos of the cities and village inside Israel. And suddenly in this halo, I saw fireworks. And you have to understand that we lose all connection to the schedule, to, to the calendar. And we didn't know what day it was because we had a routine of ambush and ambush and ambush. And every night we went to another activity. So suddenly we see those uh, fireworks in the halo. And um, I felt a tap on my leg from my commander. 
And he say, he, he whispered, you know, we are in numbers, you can't talk. And he whispered uh, quietly, happy Independence Day. And at the same moment, I felt a chill running out my back. And um, I understood, I understood the real feeling of protecting the people in Israel. They actually could celebrate because of me lying in an ambush against terrorists. So um, in a way, I'm gonna, uh, I want you to try to imagine that feeling along all my uh, lecture today. So let's start with it, please. Mm -hmm. Okay. The rise and fall of Mishmar Ayarden. Uh, Mishmar Ayarden, I want you to understand. Mishmar Ayarden, it's, it's a little Moshava, was a little Moshava uh, in the north of Israel. And when I say Moshava, you know, the, the straight translation, it's a colony. But a colony, it's a, a settlement that a state uh, is behind it. And here, uh, this Moshavot in the Galil, this uh, Moshava, no one was behind it. The people uh, bought the land uh, by themselves and uh, work in agriculture by themselves. And there was no state behind them, only a dream, a very fragile dream of maybe someday we'll have a state. And uh, so I will call it a Moshava, if you please. At the, uh, the 29th of November, 1947, the UN resolution number 181, um, you know, 33 states was uh, approved that a Jewish state be beside an Arab state will establish. And uh, 13 other states opposed it strongly. And those states were uh, mainly the Arab states. So um, the day next, the, the, the next day, uh, uh, there was two buses that went from uh, Jerusalem, from uh, Natania and Hadera toward uh, Jerusalem. And those buses, uh, have been attacked by Arab mob or uh, Arab civilians, as you wish to call it. And you can see the holes of the bullets here. Um, under this attack, five casualties, five uh, dead people and uh, another nine uh, wounded. And this, this attack has started the war of independence in Israel. The War of Independence, you can divide it to two uh, main uh, periods. The first period was inland and a uh, struggle between the Arabs and the Jewish inside Palestine or the land of Israel. The other stage is after the, declar the declaration of independence. Uh, it was in 14th of May, 1948. So until then, uh, it was like uh, a war, uh, a civil war. Okay, uh, the minute that David Ben Gurion uh, declared about the Jewish state, um, Egypt, Jordan, Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon attacked Israel immediately at the 15th of May. Uh, so the answer for that attack was to establish, this was the command of Ben Gurion of the establishment of the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force. Until then, the three forces that uh, fought against the Arab were the Haganah, the Etzel, and the Lehi, who was resistance uh, 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 underground uh, forces. But since that day on, the, uh, the main force that gave the command and prepared the war 
was the IDF. Now in the north, in the north we can see, here you can see the map of Israel, right? And if you can see the circle here is surrounded the north of Israel, which is here. And here you can see that the Syrian attacked, uh, like I said before, in 15 of May, attacked the southern part of the uh, Sea of Galilee. Here you can see, uh, here you, you no, uh, just a minute, yeah, this is the spotlight. Here you can see the Sea of Galilee, and the first attack of the Syrian was a, here under it, the southern uh, of Sea of Galilee. This attack was a failure. So they moved north. They moved to the north. And why? Because in the north was a weak spot, which is the bridge of jo daughter of Jacob. This, uh, you see this X, this X uh, symbolized the place of the bridge of jo daughter of Jacob. And uh, why it was so weak? Because it was one way and the IDF didn't uh, have time to manage to stop this attack. And it was one way, if you, if you see the big map, you could see that they could cut the Galil of Israel, the Galilee. You can, they, if, if they would pass the, uh, this bridge, they could cut immediately in something like two hours, they could get to the Mediterranean and cut the Galilee of uh, the Israel state. Now, the only thing that uh, uh, stood between the Syrian and the way to cut the Galilee was a little moshava called Mishmar Yarden. And this little moshava had only 65 defenders. Against, you see here the numbers, against 4,000 uh, so, uh, Syrian soldiers, two battalions of Syrian soldiers. So actually, what chance did they really have? Okay, with almost 65 defenders, some of them civilians, some of the uh, teenagers, and some of them women. And in front of them stood 4,000 of the uh, regular Syrian army with tanks, with artillery. What chance did they really have? So I want you to stop with that question because I want to take you to a time tunnel to the 19th century, okay? In the 19th century, if you, uh, if you can recall, uh, at the beginning of the 19th century, Napoleon with his army tried to conquer uh, the land uh, of Palestine, the land of Israel. And they stood right here, just a minute. I want to, uh, yeah, this is the spotlight. You can see there's three people here. Those three people standing on the edge of the Golan Heights. Okay, the Golan Heights is the place that the Syrian stood in 1948. So they actually look at the same direction as the Syrian commanders look when they saw Mishmar Yarden. And why is that? Because if you see those little tents here, those tents is on the exact spot of Mishmar Yarden standing. So, uh, and this is the Jacob's Daughter Bridge, which is over the Jordan River. And here is, uh, just a minute, yeah. And here is the, date of, the Daughter of jo Jacob's Bridge, uh, in a photo. You see, it is, the, this is the same bridge, only on the opposite direction. This is the Golan Heights, okay? And uh, on that spot, Mishmar Yarden stood, but in a minute, we'll get to it. Because now we see the prologue, the prologue called Shoshanata Yarden. What is Shoshanata Yarden? Shoshanata Yarden first in English, Shoshanata Yarden means the rose of the Jordan. 
אוקיי? שושנה it's a flower, it's a rose flower, a very beautiful one. And uh, שושנת הירדן was a dream. It was a dream of a, a person named Mordechai Lubovsky. Mordechai Lubovsky came from the United States and he had a dream to, to establish a farm, an agriculture farm, a cattle farm, like he saw in Oklahoma or in Texas, a big farm. So he went and uh, he asked and he found that, that uh, the owner of the land in this area was a person called Rabbi Shmuel Abu. Rabbi Shmuel Abu wasn't just a rabbi. He was the consul of France and he sat in the city named Sfat. And a few years before, Rabbi Shmuel Abu bought a lot of land in the Khula Valley. The Khula, it's a, a small lake which is northern to the Sea of Galilee. So uh, Rabbi Shmuel Abu bought a lot of land and, and now Mordechai Lubovsky in 1884 went uh, and met him and bought 500 acres from him in order to establish this farm that he dreamed of. It took him a little while to understand that he could not do it by himself. He had, he had the two sons, uh, one named Jake and one named uh, uh, um, Ali Aleib. And uh, Jake went back to the United States because the condition was too hard for him. And what was the conditions? They had a lot of disease like malaria, like fever, and uh, they had a lot of bad animals, like wild animals, like hyenas and jackals. And um, uh, he, he couldn't face them by himself. He had to be part of a whole community in order to, uh, to stand by himself, uh, to stand in, against those conditions. So he bought uh, a, a plot, a small plot in uh, Moshava nearby. Its name was Yesud Amala. This is the, the Moshava. And he leased those 500 acres to a person called Rabbi Davichu. A lot of name, I, I know, but um, uh, those names is crucial to understand the story. Okay? So Rabbi Davichu was one of the, of the foundation of the founders uh, of the Moshava Rosh Pina. And uh, he leased from uh, Lubowski those 500 acres, divided it to plots, and he found several people, 20 to be more accurate, 20 peoples who were uh, day workers in the Moshevot around. They were farmers, and he leased those plots to them. And since that day on, we called the Jordan of Rose became Mishmar Hayarden. This was the name that those uh, uh, founders of Mishmar Hayarden gave it, gave this Moshava. So this is a photo of this Moshava spot. Okay, you can see the small houses and you can see that they are just how uh, trees, several trees and you can see that the land is still wild. The agriculture is not based yet. Okay, there is no base of agriculture. It's not a common thing. And you can see the neighbors. The neighbors is Bedouin. They are not so friendly, I have to say. Okay? Uh, so this is the, the way of uh, things were in 1899. Now, Mishmar Yarden was established in 1890, okay? And the uh, foundation of this Moshava, I want you to look at the people who founded, who founded this Moshava. You see the faces, you can look for some even in the eyes of them. You can see the struggle, you can see the stubbornness, you can see the toughness, the, 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 how tough they were. They were handle a lot of hard conditions, okay? You can see even the hope. You can see the hope in the eyes and you can see the pride of the people. 
you can see how pride they were. They, they didn't have any intention to let those hard conditions to stop them from establishing a Moshava, a Jewish community in Israel land. Okay? So uh, I want you to look. This is, this is the first time that I want to uh, say full disclosure. This person here is uh, my grandmother's grandfather. And he was one of the foundation of the founders of this Moshava. He came from uh, a, a land called Bessarabia. It's near the Black Sea in Europe. And he came with his wife, Helia, and his uh, children. One's name, Abraham, the other, Jacob. And the next one is Sarah. And the last one was Issachar. Anyway, uh, this was the first, the, the uh, full disclosure part one, okay? They're gonna be another ones, okay? Now, um, this is a nice photo. I really love this photo. This is a photo of the Moshava Mishmarel. You can look at the road, you know? This road, we use it, we still use it today. It's the same road, just in asphalt, of course, but uh, it's the same road that we use it today. And it's a very ancient road. This road is uh, something like 4,000 years at least. The people use this road in order to get uh, mainly from Egypt to Mesopotamia. So this is the ancient road that crossed the Jordan and people used it in order to get to Damascus. So the Moshaba, you can see that this Moshaba is standing both sides of this road. And uh, you can even say that our forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, maybe walked there either. Okay? Uh, if you see this, uh, this junction here in the middle, it leads to the northern part of Israel, uh, to Tel Dan, and even to Lebanon. Okay? It's a very crucial ro uh, road, so you must be understand why the Syrian wanted to conquer this road a few years later. This is the bridge that I talked about, okay? You can see the fashion, okay? The fashion is long sleeve, so you can say, you may say that this was the winter, but no, you're wrong, because it's not the winter. If you look at the Jordan River that goes under this bridge, you can see that it's uh, divided to two. So it's a shadow water. And if it's a shallow water, the, 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 air, the time that this picture been taken, it must be June or even July. It's very hot at that time, but still, this is the fashion to, log, to go with long sleeves. So <laughs> this is it. And here you can see inside the Moshava, Mishmar Yarden. By the way, this is the year 1912 that my grandmother's been born. So uh, we cannot see her here in this photo, but you can see the young trees. They, uh, the shade is not very uh, strong now, but they will grow in a few years, I promise you. But uh, now, uh, in a few years, we come to the World War I. You know, the, then they call it the big war because they had no idea that in several years, they're going to have World War II. But uh, in this big war, the Ottoman Empire drafted everyone they could, even Jews, even Christian, even Muslims. They had no, uh, they, they put no difference between those three uh, religions. And uh, they drafted everyone falsely. They had to have soldiers. But Several people drafted a uh, volunteer. And one of them is, you see, full disclosure, part two. Okay, this is this is the elder son of Chaim Gelbiser, which we saw 
in the first uh, uh, disclosure. And uh, as, sorry, this is Avraham Gelgisa, I forgot. Uh, anyway, Avraham Gelgisa is the elder son of Chaim Gelgisa. And he listed to the army voluntarily in order for them to say that the Jewish people are not cowards. So he became an officer in the Ottoman army and he fought in the Balkans war in Europe. And after it, he returned to the Holy Land. And in Roshpina, he met a very nice girl and he proposed her. And she said, yes. So he went to release from the army, but unfortunately he caught a disease and died from it. And um, uh, this is it. Now, after World War I, uh, the British Empire got a mandate over uh, Palestine. Uh, to be more accurate, the British and the French get this mandate, okay? And here we can see, if we look closely enough, we can see here that this is the border between those two mandates. And if you can see this uh, circle, it says that this is uh, the place of Mishmar Yarden. So Mishmar Yarden is actually standing on the border, which means it's uh, a frontier Mosheva. And uh, it will be crucial in a few years. I will, uh, understand, uh, I will explain it later. And um, now we can see this Mosheva in 1920. You see, those trees are bigger now. You can see the shade of it. Okay, it's cooler. Although I have to say, I live in this area today and it's very hot area in the summer, but still because of the shade, it can be cooler. You can see the salvo. You can see an organized Mosheva. And here you can see the synagogue. He is the center of every Jewish settlement, every Jewish city, every Jewish village. The center of it is the synagogue. And this, this synagogue is gonna play a very crucial part in the war of independence in 28 years from now, because this picture is taken in 1920. Anyway, now we can see the pump. In 1924, at last they brought a pump. So far, they hadn't had any pump, so they had to use a donkey and a cart in order to get to the Jordan River and to fetch water from it. The Jordan River, uh, I want to explain it, uh, the Jordan River is 70 meters down from uh, the, from the Moshava. So we have to go down in order to fetch water. And they used a very large uh, pot to, uh, to bring the water up to the Mosheva. And the cart was very heavy. And one of the, the stories that my grandmother told me, uh, I am sure that you love it. Uh, one of the story is uh, that my, uh, her father, my great grandfather went in the middle of August to fetch water from the Jordan. So uh, he, uh, the, the donkey felt very good in the water because it was the middle of August and it, the heat is on and the water is cool. The donkey wouldn't come out. So my great grandfather pulled the string, pull it, pull it. The donkey didn't move, you know, donkey, okay? Uh, very, it can be very stubborn. So finally, my great grandfather got furious and he hit the donkey's head with his fist. And unfortunately, unfortunately, the donkey fell and died. So he had to pull the cart by himself to this Moshava. And when he got there, everyone saw his red face and his sweat. And they say, what happened? He said, oh, nothing, nothing. Everything is cool. So finally, in 1924, 
they didn't tend to use this donkey anymore because they had this pump. This person, they, this couple, young couple, uh, named Rivka and Chaim Grabowski. And in uh, the first years in the 30s, uh, they got a plot in Mishmar Yerden. And uh, it was very symbolic because my family moved from Mishmar Yerden in 1929 and they left this pot. Now, what is so symbolic, uh, Rivka Grabowski, this woman here, uh, used to call uh, Rivka Feinstein. She was the fiance of Abraham Gelbgisser, okay, the brother of Jacob, my great grandfather. Remember him that he proposed her? So, um, she, uh, after she, uh, the, the period of mourning, uh, she uh, met this young man, this handsome young man, uh, Chaim, Gelbis, uh, Chaim Grabowski, and uh, she married him. And they got our, our, my family's plot and start to build their families. And now uh, we're getting to the 30s. And the, 30, the 30s was the days of illegal immigrants. I'm sure that you heard about, about it. Um, the illegal immigrants uh, from the countries that surround Palestine, uh, I mean Persia, I mean Iraq, I mean Syria, and it was illegal immigrant, but um, so they had to pass behind the eyes, under the eyes of the British and the French. So they had to cross the Jordan River by night. And after it, they came into the, uh, the Mosheva and got a hot meal and a hot tea and fresh clothes. And uh, in this Mosheva, they uh, fed them and send them away to the, uh, to the inner land of uh, Israel, Israel land and Palestine, and uh, they spread all around the settlements in, in, in Palestine. Now, uh, in 1936, it started the great Arab revolt in Palestine. A few words about this revolt. The, the Arabs, it's, uh, as you show, as you know, uh, opposed the Jewish immigrant uh, to Palestine, and uh, they thought that the English are for the Jewish, and they revolt for it and the rebel for it, and uh, they start to uh, shoot and harass. Russell, uh, uh, the people in Israel, and uh, in Mishmar Yarden, they the first thing the, the first thing that they did is to blast the pump. So the people in Mishmar Yarden had to use the donkey and the cart again. And one of the day, one of these days, uh, Chaim Grabowski and his son Menachem Grabowski went to the Jordan River to fetch water and did the curl of the road, uh, the Arabs waited for them. They did an ambush and they shoot both of them and killed them. And after it, they ran away and the people from the Mosheva brought them to the Mosheva. And uh, this was the first casualties of Mishmar Yarden. And unfortunately it was the first a um, cup of misery uh, that Rivka Grabowski should drink. You will see it in a while. But uh, the first, uh, the, the next uh, slide, and here you can see the, this Mosheva in the 40s. You can see, um, just a minute, I use this uh, spotlight. Yeah, you can see this Mosheva. You can see the road, the ancient road, and you can see this is the curl of the road where, uh, where those people got killed, where uh, Chaim Grabowski and his son Menachem got killed. 
And here you can see this bridge. You remember the bridge, the Jacobs of Dotter Bridge? And this is, of course, the, the Jordan River. Now, um, this, uh, just a minute, yeah. Um, the next slide is the water canal. In the 40s, they fixed the water canal uh, and they brought a brand new uh, pump. So uh, they used the water canal uh, also, not just for water, but also for elec uh, electricity. You know, Mishmar Erden hadn't had any electricity until the 40s. So uh, it was a very good years in the 40s, in the beginning of the 40s, years of peace and prosperity. And they got, the first time they got public transportation. You can see here the bus with, uh, with flowers and people with horses uh, surrounding him because it was a celebration day that the bus is finally uh, coming into this Moshava once a day. Okay, don't be so, <laughs> once a day, uh, they had bus in the Moshava in the beginning of the 40s. Now, these years of, um, you know, on these years, uh, the, the houses of the Moshava, there were something like 31 houses. Finally, they had uh, people that lived there in all the houses. Until then, some of them always were empty because people died from the malaria and people went out. And finally, in the 40s, the, the, the full houses was uh, full uh, uh, loaded. Anyway, now this is the uh, Declaration of Independence. And we can see the first Prime Minister, David Ben-Gurion. You know, I can see this film again and again, and I get excited every time. It's a very happy moment, but I have to cut it because I told you before, the Syrian is on the Jordan, waiting to attack these 65 defenders in Mishmar Yarden. And the battles began in 6th of June. In 6th of June at night, they started to blast the Moshava, to bomb the Moshava with artillery. And the, the next day, people from the Moshava stopped the Syrian from crossing the Jordan River by guns. They had only guns. The commander of the defenders went to their main headquarter in Roshkina and begged for them to send him and reinforcement. But the commander was, uh, uh, he, he had a lack of experience. And finally, he sent a company that came to Moshava, uh, a, co a company of soldiers that came to, to this Moshava, and uh, they got there by night. And the night, the Syrian don't attack. So, 
they, they, they heard silence and they saw that there was no war. So they went back according to their orders. So the defenders got another reinforcement, a little one from the settlements around it. And finally, at the 10th of June, as you see, was the final battle with 65 defenders. At the 10th of June in the morning, the Syrians succeeded to, to make a circle around the Moshava and get a tank from one side and the soldiers come from the other side and they, they start fighting from house to house, from balcony to balcony and in the street. And I want to uh, show you the story of Rivka Grabowski. And uh, she saw her son, Carmi, her second son, I have to, pay, to say, uh, she saw him standing in a balcony and shoot the, uh, the machine gun. Uh, he shouted to the Syrian, which means uh, in Arabic, uh, brothers, uh, brothers, don't be afraid, come over here. And the Syrian uh, actually thought that one of them got a position and they came. So he succeeded of shooting and killed some of them. This way he proceeded for several times and he wouldn't move them until uh, uh, he told his mother, I don't move from here until the reinforcement will come. So the mother understood that she has no way to persuade him to come with her. And she ran to the uh, basement, to the last basement. And uh, when she turned her head, backwards to her son, she saw him catch a bullet and die and fall to the ground. And after it, she entered to the last basement, which you can see here, this is the last basement. And all the defenders went to this last basement. And when they understood they had no choice and they had no hope, they raised their hands and started to move out. The first two was the chief of this Moshava, Elazar Segal, and they shoot him to death. Uh, so 49 defenders finally went to be a prisoner of war in Damascus. And this is Rivka Grabowski in those years. And this is her late son who got killed, the second son. Karmi Grabowski, just think of the uh, agony that this woman had to bear. She lost her fiance in 1917. She lost her husband and elder son in 1938. And now she saw her, her second son catch a bullet in 1948 and she became prisoner of war in Damascus for nine whole months. So um, she returned after nine months. You know, they hold the men, they hold them for 14 months. And the women got released after nine months. And after nine, nine months, she came and saw the ruins of this Moshava. And in those ruins, because no one got there because it, it was a demilitarized zone, so no one uh, could get there uh, uh, during the war. And then she returned and found the remains of her son. She recognized it by, by the shirt that he had and uh, she brought him to grave, to Jewish grave, finally, in Rosh Pina Cemetery. This was, uh, this is the ruins of this Moshava and he, if you can see, I ask a question, is this really the end of the story? And I want to, to uh, talk about it later. Now you can see the people looking at the ruins of their houses. You can see this old man who collapsed and supported by 
the surround the people that surround him uh, because he uh, he broke when he saw the house you can see those houses this is what the syrian did to the houses of this Mosheva. Now, uh, we get into the 9th of July, 1948. The 9th of July, 1948, started Operation Brosh. Operation Brosh, the main purpose is to conquer back the land of Mishmar Erden. You see this board in this map? This board, the Syrian couldn't pass this board. They stopped there after they conquered this Mosheva. So actually, the people in Mishmar Erden did what they had to do. They stopped the Syrian and they gave the IDF, the Israel Defense Force, enough time to organize and to stop the Syrian from cutting the Galilee of Israel. The people in Mishmar Erden were the heroes, like in um, like in uh, in uh, like I said in the beginning, Alamo. The Israeli Alamo. Yeah, like in the Alamo. Forgot the name. Sorry. Now these two young men were born in Mishmar Erden. It's another full disclosure, as you see, and they were the son of Jacob Gelbiser. They got killed in the War of Independence. This one here, Shlomo Gelbiser, got killed, got himself killed while he was operating the machine gun and uh, in the area of the Air Force, of Ben Gurion Air Force today, the middle of Israel. And the other one, they were twins, by the way, they were twins. The other one, uh, got killed in the war against the Egyptian while stopping a tank by himself. He stopped a tank with a Molotov battle. And they both got killed. They were the brothers of my grandmother. And this is Mishmar Erden as it looks today, in our day. They left one house, one coat contour of a farmer house, just to uh, see how it was. This is the entrance to the cemetery, to the old cemetery of Mishmar Erden, and this is the cemetery. This is the last basement where the defenders gathered around before they went to, uh, uh, to Damascus. And this is the monument that they built after they returned to Israel, they built this monument from the houses. Okay? And this is uh, me telling the tale to kids because this is what I do and this is what I'm going to do tomorrow. Going to Mishmar Yodan monument and tell the tale. I do it for several years now because I want everyone, everybody knows this story. And this is my, this is the full disclosure part four. This is my ancestors. This is Jacob Gelgiser, the son of Chaim Gelgiser and the brother of Abraham Gelgiser. And he is the, the father of my grandmother. This is my grandmother, Chaya. And she is the mother of this young person here who was my, uh, my father. This is my late, uh, parents, God uh, rest in peace, God bless them. And this is my dynasty. And I remember that I uh, asked a question, is this really the end? You can see here photos of two former uh, Knesset members who is the descendants of the people of Mishmar Erden. Here you can see a reporter uh, and he is also Gil Tamari, this is his name. This one is a former uh, Knesset member, Feiglin, Moshe Feiglin. And this one is a former member, Knesset member, uh, Zvulon Urlev. And um, 
we, I, I, I let myself uh, between those three great men, um, we, the people, the descendants of Mishmar Yarden, we still tell the tale of Mishmar Yarden, we still hold the dream of the, the, the foundation of the founders of Mishmar Yarden. And this is the story of Mishmar Yarden between other stories of uh, the war of independence. If you remember, Julia said at the beginning of the stories that everybody familiar about. So this is the story, this is the, uh, the, the, the vehicles, the Meshurianim in the entrance of Jerusalem. And everybody knows their story. Now, I, I happy to say that uh, another, uh, even more people know the story of Mishmar Ayodeh. Thank you very much for listening. Yeah, Yaniv, Tadaraba. Uh, thank you very much. Um, well, you know that this is not the first time I hear the story, and yet each time, you know, over and over again, it is a, a moving one, and it is the one to think about and uh, to pass to pass to the next generation. So, um, thank you for sharing. Uh, we will uh, turn to some questions on the chat, and yeah, uh, um, yeah. and uh, you are you are welcome to write more questions if you have any, and uh, you need you can get a sip of water in the meanwhile. Okay, I hope you have a bottle of water because the tour guide must have water nearby. Okay, so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right. Uh, so the question by Robin. Um, I will read it for you, and well, uh, if I, I can uh, answer as well. Uh, okay. So Robin asks. I thought Bedouins don't usually own the land. So from whom did Rabbi Abu originally buy the land? Uh, Rabbi Abu bought the land. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the empire, the, the Ottoman Empire, uh, did the reform at the uh, 30s of the 19th century, uh, a reform of lands. So they wanted to write the lands to a, an owner. And um, the farmers that uh, uh, walked on the land for one year, they wanted to write this land up, upon him. So Rabbi uh, Abu bought the lands from the farmers. All right. In other words, uh, they did own the land at that point. Yep. Okay, great. Uh, Pamela's question is, uh, where did your family move to after they left Moshav Mishmar Yarden, and where were you born? Okay, my family um, moved to Givatayim. And uh, after uh, that both of his son, his twin sons, got killed, he built a synagogue near his house in Givatayim. And I was born in Ramat Gan, a city that's very close to Givatayim. And my bar mitzvah I did in this synagogue because it was a synagogue of our family. Okay. Uh, Harry asked, uh, in the 1930s, was anyone arrested for smuggling people in, smuggling the uh, illegal Jews? Um, uh, a few people got caught and arrested, but most of them didn't. Most of them spread inside the settlements and, um, and vanished between the population. Yeah. Uh, well, that, that speaking of uh, the uh, overland uh, smugglers, uh, if we speak of uh, the illegal sheep, the Ha'apala, 
uh, yeah, we this was... so yes, so then this is a totally different story. And yes, many of them were arrested, and many of them were actually imprisoned uh, in Akko, in Jerusalem, yeah. in Atlit, yeah. But uh, what Yaniv mentioned, the, the overland uh, illegal immigration, that was almost 100% success. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, oh, right. Uh, 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 yeah, okay, Robin asked another question, which is an important one. Could they have rebuilt the Moshav like the descendants rebuilt Gush Etzion? Okay, okay, that's this is a more difficult question than you think, Robin. So yeah, here we go. Because, um, I don't want to get into it because of this... Um, holiest hol, holiness of this day because it's uh, in the matter of speaking it's a kind of political question the people in Mishmar Yarden were a date identified politically to the wrong side so the main uh, the main authorities who was Mapai um, had wanted to, uh, I, I don't want if they want, but it's, uh, it's very hard to say it, if they did it deliberately or not. And, uh, but finally, the, the, on the lands of Ishmar Yarden, they established two settlements. One is a kibbutz and the other one is a moshav. And after it, this moshav uh, changed its name to Mishmar Yarden, some kind of tribute to the story of Mishmar Yarden. Right. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, Linda asked, uh, where do you live now? I live in a kibbutz called the Lehavot Abashan, and it's near the Golan Heights. And it's, uh, is this, um, it's something like 15 kilometers or even less from a, uh, the first point of Mishmar Yarden. So you can almost see it from where you live now. No. Okay. Um, uh, right. Uh, Alvin asked... Uh, what my uncle, sorry. Uh, just a minute. I want to proceed. Uh, my uncle, when I, uh, when I went to, uh, to live here, my uncle wrote me, you came back home to Mishmar Yarden. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah, almost. Okay, yeah. uh, Alvin asked, uh, what can you tell us about Mitzpegadot? Mitzpegadot, it's, a, it's a, a spot of a later war, okay? Mitzpegadot was a post of the Syrian army before 1967, because in 1948, the, the border became the, the, the Jordan River. So uh, behind it, the Syrian uh, built uh, a, a line of post, of posts, and one of them was uh, Mitzpegadot. And after 1967, when we uh, freed the Golan, uh, we um, we built the uh, Mitzpe. <laughs> okay, just to help uh, with the Hebrew, Mitzpe literally means a lookout. And uh, Mitzpeh Gedot is, is a, a lookout. It's uh, just as you said, but now it is a well-organized lookout, which enables you to look at uh, the Galilee and specifically Kibbutz Gedot, uh, the way the Syrians could see it before uh, the Six Days War. Okay, uh, that just before we proceed, since uh, we start losing people, as it always happens in the end of the presentation, so uh, just a reminder of the pay as you wish thing. We will always appreciate your donations. And also remind you that we are in this very special week of uh, the Fallen Soldiers Memorial Day and the Independence Day, which starts a second after the Fallen Soldiers Day is over, which is always so difficult for us living here. So, uh, this uh, Memorial Day started this evening and you see the your side candles behind me 
And then tomorrow evening, we will have the celebrations of the Independence Day of Yom Ma'ut. And then Thursday is the actual Independence Day. And then our presentation will be dedicated to the very proof of the independence, which is the Knesset and the Supreme Court and this, the whole area of uh, Givat Ram in Jerusalem. So you're welcome to join me there uh, the day after tomorrow. And then next Tuesday, a week from now, uh, we have a special presentation, um, really special and, and different, I believe, for most of you. Uh, Ami Brown will be talking about the poetry, or better to say, the reflection of the War of Independence in the Israeli contemporary poetry. So uh, you're welcome to this one as well, of course. All right. Thank you for staying with us. And uh, we are back to questions. So, uh, Yaniv, um, okay, Rajan asked, uh, why is it called illegal immigration? Because um, they, had, um, they had a number of Jewish people that allowed to come to uh, Palestine at that period, according to the White Book that's written uh, by the government of Britain. So uh, if we uh, pass this number, if we pass this number, uh, this is illegal. It was illegal for the time being. It was illegal according to the law as, as it existed at the time. Yeah. Yep. All right. Amazing. Um, okay. Um, Okay, Elvin says uh, the Bailey Bridge was a Bnot Yaakov Bridge for many years until the new bridge was built. Is the Bailey Bridge still there? Yep, the, ba the Bailey Bridge is still there, but uh, it doesn't work. Okay, because there is a concrete bridge, now, a, a new one that uh, they built a uh, few years ago. And this Bailey Bridge is now um, like a monument. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Howard asked, uh, can you explain the difference between a Moshav and a Kibbutz? Yeah, it's um, like the difference between uh, communism and socialism. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. A Kibbutz, it's... Um, it's a, 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 a company, uh, no, not a company. Um, it's, it's a way of living where you don't own a, a private property. And uh, this property that you own belongs to the kibbutz, even uh, fridge, even the bed. It's not your bed, it's the kibbutz's bed. Uh, bed. Okay, Moshav, you have uh, your plot, but you have a uh, community responsibility. So if uh, they both, uh, both the kibbutz and both the Moshav are agriculture uh, settlements, but the Moshav, everyone, every family has its own plot. And if one gets to trouble, or uh, losing the money, or uh, the uh, the cattle didn't uh, get, uh, didn't give a lot of milk this, that year, and he has no uh, enough money. So the others should help him. This is the meaning of the moshav. It's kind of socialism, but a little. Yeah, I just want to add to it that uh, what you need said was true at the time being. I mean, today the kibbutz yeah. theme had changed. And uh, so today we have no perfect uh, communism and no perfect socialism. And uh, we, we have everything in between. But that was the original idea of uh, kibbutz. Uh, OK. Um, Luis uh, asked, uh, did the prisoners of the Syrians talk about how their period of Incarceration in Syria was 
well, that's a new word. Well, basically imprisonment, I guess. Um, how, yeah, how they talked. Mm -hmm. They talked. Rivka Grabowski even wrote a book about it. And she wrote about her experience in the prison. Uh, lots of them talk. They're still talking. Uh, their, their sons, their descendants still talk about it. So what do they say? It's a rough time. They uh, suffer torture. torture um, Rivka, for example, uh, lost a finger in the fighting. And in prison, they, uh, they didn't give her immediate care about it. Okay, she was wounded and they didn't care immediately. They waited a week or uh, even two weeks. Uh, they, um, you know, they, they, they interrogate her uh, while questioning all the time, where is the tunnel? Where is the tunnel? Where is the tunnel? What tunnel, she said. Um, and they uh, explained her, uh, 65 defenders cannot stop 4,000 soldiers. So you must have a tunnel that leads to the <laughs> to Hoshpina or to another settlement where the soldier ran away. They couldn't believe that there were only 65 defenders. I see. Uh, well, Alvin just wanted you to know that he was a volunteer at Kibbutz Gunin, the neighbor of Leavota Bashan, but that mm -hmm. was in 1970, which was before you ever been to Leavota Bashan. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I was three years old back then. <laughs> and you were still in give a time. <laughs> um, all right. Well, right now we ran out of questions. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for asking. If you'd like to say something now, you're welcome to say so. We would love to hear your voice. And, um, and otherwise, that's it. Uh, questions? Well, that was a great family story. Uh, we don't, we haven't heard too many in the prior 85 episodes of uh, real, <laughs> personal, real personal, real people going back, what, four generations? I mean, that's amazing. Five. Five, wow. Well, thank you very much for sharing that. I think it was very meaningful to everybody uh, listening in. Mm -hmm. I, I do have one thank comment you. on the issue of uh, Moshavs. If you live in an American condo, a condominium, you're essentially living in a kibbutz. Okay. <laughs> well, that's something uh, only Americans can understand you. and tell you it's true or not. I, I disagree. Uh, that makes you want to disagree? No. Uh, most, uh, most not, not, not at, at all. Not at all. A, uh, not at all in any way. A co-op is basically the um, a kibbutz. A condominium is basically a moshav. But no one helps <laughs> anyone else. Yeah. The only thing you're talking about is owning separate places. Originally, it was. <laughs> I don't. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, Yaniv, it's basic. It's no I don't think I would compare anything to them, but it's just yeah. me. Yaniv, it was excellent, and your English is excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely <laughs> wonderful. Yes, thank and your you. sense of humor, your sense of humor, and Yay. you know, just all kinds of mannerisms. Perfect. <laughs> Just perfect. So it was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and I and I have to say, Julia told me before that Yaniv has never done this in English, correct? Yaniv? Yep. Oh. Wow. Has given this talk in English. Oh, so not a problem. Julia, amazing, 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 wonderful. Julia and Yaniv worked really, really hard. This isn't just which which also goes to what I said before about how we really have to help Julia with whatever kind of donations we can. And because Julia just didn't pick Yaniv, you know, oh, okay, let's have Yaniv give his talk about Mishmar Hanega, Mishmar Hayyaden. And Yaniv just says, okay, I'll just give my talk because I've done it a hundred times. They both worked really, really hard to put this together in English. And now that Yaniv has perfected it in English, now you can just go all over the world with this, Yaniv. You know, all the English speakers all over. I mean, really and, busy. <laughs> and, and I just want to tell you that I've been up there. I mean, I live in Israel too, but I've been up there and I've seen it, but I, I never knew the history of it the way you told it. It was just wonderful. Just wonderful. Thank so you. thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Pamela. Thank you so much for your words. And yes, we we uh, did exchange quite a few uh, private chats, uh, but but since you've uh, made it public, so yes, I uh, I agree. And uh, I mean, I was just listening and making some comments, uh, but but Ian was really really uh, working hard. And um, well, now I can also tell you that he is not just a colleague and, uh, and a friend, but he also a former student of mine because uh, I was the coordinator of the tour guides course. He took some years ago, so. and so I was really, I really felt so responsible for whatever going to happen. And but I knew that I can trust him. So uh, when we first raised the subject about a month ago, when was it? Uh, I, I asked him because I did hear him talking about the subject in Hebrew, and I was amazing. But so I asked him, can you possibly do it in English? And he said, yes. And I, I said, are you sure? And he said, yes, I'm sure. And then I knew that if he said he's sure, it's going to work. And yet I was so nervous. And, uh, <laughs> and now the whole thing is, is over. And so, you need to thank you so much for, for working so hard and sharing everything with thank us. Thank you. Well, you. Do not worry. Don't so, stop. Uh, proceed. Proceed. I want to hear more. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's like uh, as another uh, colleague of mine, uh, when somebody praises him because he is an amazing tour guide and each time somebody praises him, he's like, oh, no, stop. No, no, go on. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know him. I will now tell the name. Uh, anyway, um, ladies and can, gentlemen. Can I, just uh, add a, can I just add a word or two? Yeah, uh, sure. I, thought, I, I just want to tell you that I thought it was fabulous fabulous and i could go on and on and on but i think that i've said what i believe and i think both we can't hear you larry it, it muted you think something no it's not no it's, no, not, it's not muted anymore you no. muted. okay i just want to say that how how wonderful i thought this was julia and i i want to just commend you i make it a point i never miss this webinar never and since I started it. and it's wow. the best webinar that i watch on on the computer and i watch a lot of this stuff but yours is the best and i i commend you for a wonderful job and thank you oh uh, well yes wow this is amazing i mean listen if you never missed even one presentation so that's more than I can say. Like, I missed a few. <laughs> Ilana, you remember, I was in the desert. I was there and here. And yeah, it happened. Greece, stuff like that. Uh, but if you never missed even one, this is like, that's incredible. Thank you for letting me know. I mean, Larry, I, I am used to seeing your face like this tiny little. And I'm looking forward to see you full size. You know? Whenever. <laughs> I, I should thanks mention, for, thanks for, for sharing. I should mention that when we have oh. the 100th episode, which is not too far off, there will be an examination, and I'll keep you in mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. We actually have to think of some sort of a quiz or something. Yeah. A yeah. celebration. Oh, you need to Daraba again. Um, guys, it is, uh, you know, uh, another thing just, just to keep in mind, you know, uh, this is the eve of uh, the Memorial Day, and uh, you know I came back from the ceremony, and and Yaniv did the same. And when we started discussing, it, I, I like I asked him, uh, "Are you sure you will be able to do the the presentation immediately after, like ten minutes after the ceremony?" And he said yes, and he did it. And this is it's not easy, you know. He he has. Uh, is it okay if I will tell them, Geneva? Okay, no. he has two sons. Uh, both of them just finished their military service. And for all of us, you know, having children and, and especially sons and especially sons of this more or less age, um, the Memorial Day for the Fallen Soldiers is so difficult and so emotional and so personal. And, um, and it's far from being obvious that somebody uh, can can make a presentation uh, this this very day. Um, so 
I really appreciate it and uh, תודה רבה. שוב, תודה רבה. Thank you very much. Really, thank you very much. I think so. Thank you. לילה טוב. תודה רבה. נדבר. Take us to places that other people wouldn't. Like having had today's presentation, that's a place I didn't even know existed and what they did. And I think that makes it even more significant. So don't worry about his English. The important thing is the content. His English is wonderful. Yes, I need to remember yeah. him yeah. regularly. Thank God for my husband who writes the checks. You also have to think of his English is like a billion times better than most of our Hebrew. Just think of it. <laughs> well, you, you, never, uh, you never deliver the presentation in Hebrew, so that's fine. You don't have to speak Hebrew. Uh, we try to improve your Hebrew, though. Tov, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. And I uh, will we'll see you child. all um, the day after tomorrow next to the Knesset. Feel free to stick around if you want to schmooze. If not, see you in 47 hours. <laughs> exactly. We are now in schmooze mode. That means that anybody's welcome to raise any topic. And, uh, and just follow one rule, which we have to constantly repeat. Uh, the important rule is you must be wearing shoes. Nothing right. else really matters. Everything is optional. Not wear shoes, sorry, Steve. <laughs>